What's up, what's up, what's up? Welcome back, everybody, to Sales Performance Improvement Radio. I'm your host, Terry Hansen. It's great to be back with you once again on another episode, episode number nine. Excited to spend some time with you today. Uh, today, you know, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about one simple, simple way to avoid a lot of the common sales performance problems that sales leaders have in their organizations by doing one, one thing. If you do this one thing, it will decrease the quantity of sales performance problems that you have in your company, in your organization, probably by a factor of 10. So stick with me. You know, I'm conscientious of the fact that sales managers, sales leaders uh, of all flavors uh, get, frankly, pretty dang tired of dealing with salespeople who say, uh, come in late, or maybe don't work as hard as they would like, or perpetually kind of miss quota, or their sales activity numbers aren't quite as high as they would like to be. They're full of excuses. They're easily distracted. They're not closing sales quickly enough. And despite lots of interventions and lots of efforts to try to improve performance, they, they're not quite uh, things are just that they're okay. They're not bad enough to really terminate and let the salesperson go, but they're surely not like super amazing and super stellar. So uh, th- there's this is very common. So how do you how do you overcome this? How do you combat this? Well, uh, as mentioned in the intro, I I want to share with you one uh, one simple way to avoid a lot of the sales problems just by doing one simple thing. And I want to preface that with uh, uh, with a quick story. Uh, from years ago. No, not all of the experiences that I've had in, uh, in my, uh, in my history have been, have been good ones, as a matter of fact. And when you, uh, as you guys know, uh, back in 2005, I started my own outsourced sales enablement and sales operations company. And I worked with hundreds and hundreds of different clients all across the country in a variety of different capacities to really uh, all, all focused on helping their sales teams perform at their, at their peak potential. But I remember many, many years ago, I, I had kind of a nasty experience that really taught me a pretty profound and powerful lesson. Um, the company was uh, actually a digital marketing agency. I worked very closely with the business owner. We, he, uh, he was referred to me by a, by a mutual acquaintance, and he shared with me some of the challenges that he was having with his two salespeople and mentioned that he'd like my help. And so initially we got started doing quite a bit of sales training and trained their sales team, how to prospect and how to qualify, how to uh, present good solutions and how to close sales and how to overcome objections and really train them on some advanced tactics and strategies to help them really do a good job there. And, but despite the training, the problems persisted. And so we determined that the next best thing to do would be to conduct some uh, disc assessments on them. So we had all of the, uh, uh, the, the business owner who was the acting sales manager himself uh, and the two salespeople, they took disc assessments. And so we reviewed the details of the disc assessments and, and, t- and trained again on different strategies to adapt to different personalities. And I worked with the business owner to help him take his leadership to the next level and how he managed these two different individuals these two sales ladies, uh, how we motivated them, worked with them, coached them, et cetera. And, uh, but after, after several months, guess what? The performance of these two sales gals had not improved. They were still not hitting the sales metrics, the numbers that it was taken, uh, that, that, that was needed to hit, hit, hit quota. Uh, they're investing a lot of good money with me each and every single month, but, but, behavior wasn't changing and results weren't changing and sales weren't increasing. It was kind of still kind of staying the same and it was getting kind of hard, frankly. And um, in one of our coaching calls, executive coaching calls, the business owner asked me a question. He said, he said, are these, uh, you know, one gal, uh, her, her name was Sarah. Uh, he said, is, uh, is Sarah the right person for this company? She's wonderful. I love her to death. She's a sweetheart, a darling gal, but is she the right person for this job? And I was in a tough position because one half of my brain felt very, very responsible for the performance of Sarah, this, this sales gal. We had done training. We had done coaching. I'd been there at the office to observe and monitor how she did. I offered coaching and feedback, and I had really poured a lot of hard work and effort and energy into improving the performance of this gal, Sarah, and it, it hadn't worked. 
And so at, at, when he asked me the question, is she the right person for the job? Part of me was like, well, if I say no, she's not the right person for the job, all of that hard work and effort and energy going into her will be wasted. She'll be fired and let go. And everything that we've done will be kind of for not what a bloody shame to have all of that hard work kind of go for not uh, plus it'll kind of make me look bad. I should have identified at the onset. This is the wrong person for the job. And, uh, and, 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 and you should let her go right away. But I hadn't and I didn't. And so I said, no, you know, she'll come around. It'll change. Sometimes these things take a little bit to, to percolate. So stick with it. And so we stuck with it another month. And then he asked me again, is she, I'm, I, I really am seriously thinking about letting her go. And I just don't think she's the right person for the job. What do you think? And I said, no, nope, give her some time, give her some time. And I kind of took the weak route. I took the lower road and kind of pandered towards retaining the client uh, not invalidating all the hard work and effort that had gone into it. And I procrastinated and, and ultimately said, uh, said, stick with it. And uh, uh, let another month go by. And finally, he's like, I've got to let her go. And I said, okay, go ahead and let her go. And it wasn't quickly, it wasn't too long after that interaction that he let her go, that, uh, that he ended our partnership uh, on kind of a sour note. Uh, and uh, ultimately, he made the accusation you should have, you should have told me much, much earlier that she was not the right fit for the position. And I should have let her go a long time ago, but because we delayed so long, uh, I, sales are down. I've spent a lot of money. What you're doing isn't working. And I want to end our partnership. And it ended on a sour note. And I've always remembered that kind of sour experience. And it taught me a pretty powerful lesson. And the powerful lesson is this. Uh, two lessons, actually. Number one is you hire slowly, but you fire quickly. And that's an age old line that we've heard for a long time. Hire slowly, do a lot of good due diligence and take a long time. A long time is relative, but meaning do good due diligence and make sure that when you hire somebody, they're a, they've been really well scrubbed, really well vetted, right? And then when it comes, when you're getting the thought that it's time to turn this person loose, they're not cut out for the position, do it quickly, do it now, do it fast. Don't delay, don't wait. So that was the first important lesson. The second important lesson that I learned is had uh, this business owner taken the time to properly vet Sarah, he probably should never have hired her in the first place. And the second lesson is you can avoid a lot of sales performance problems simply by making sure that you hire good people. So if you want to, in your organization, avoid a lot of heartache and a lot of headache uh, dealing with sales enablement and getting your sales team and your marketing team and your IT team and all of the teams involved in, in, in generating revenue for your company, if you want that to go smoother, then just do one thing and one thing only. Make sure that you hire slowly and fire quickly. Do a good job at hiring. So for the balance of our time, I do want to spend um, uh, a few minutes chatting with you about uh, some strategies that you can use to actually hire really good salespeople and make sure that you don't run into uh, a lot of buyer's remorse and a lot of regret after the fact. And uh, so these strategies that I'll share with you, I actually take a little bit of a, uh, a page out of the playbook of a guy named Mark Roberge. Uh, back in 2007, when HubSpot was just getting started, HubSpot hired Mark Roberge to be their, uh, their, their senior vice president over sales and revenue. And so he really helped take HubSpot uh, and really kind of built out their, their entire sales organization. And an engineer by training, he kind of fell into the revenue side, but approached growing and scaling revenue much like, a, a, like a, an engineer would. And after he kind of retired, moved on and did some other things, he wrote a book, a very cool book that I love, uh, that I actually am, am kind of going back through uh, again, probably I think for the third or fourth time, uh, called The Sales Acceleration Method or the sales acceleration formula, excuse me. So I highly recommend it to you. But in that book, Mark Roberge actually talks about a hiring formula that he used for HubSpot uh, uh, long ago. And I'll share a couple of thoughts with you uh, based, on, uh, based on that. 
Uh, but basically his philosophy was take your top producing salespeople right now and profile them, identify their behaviors, identify their attitudes and say their, their mindset, identify their, the kind of technical uh, knowledge that they have, and also identify their skill sets that they have. Uh, so BASC, behaviors, attitudes, skills, knowledge. So I, I really do a good job at profiling your top producers, your top performers, the ones that kill it, and develop a little bit of a model. And what you're trying to develop is a template that you can hire against. So for him, uh, in his world, at an early stage tech startup where salespeople were selling business to business in a rapidly, um, uh, a rapidly growing and, and evolving environment, uh, with a state-of-the-art kind of breakthrough piece of technology, he identified five characteristics of his top salespeople. And I'll share those with you uh, with a caveat that that these five kind of characteristics or qualities really represented uh, HubSpot's early days and not necessarily your company or my company or anybody else's company out there, but they just serve as a, a good template. But so if your salespeople happen to be uh, B2B salespeople, if they happen to be selling a SaaS or a software product and your environment and your company is rapidly evolving, well, then maybe these five characteristics will also be a good match for you. But I appreciated not so much the five characteristics or qualities, but how he interviews and qualifies his candidate qualified his candidates for each of these five. So that's really what I want you to cue into and clue clue into and pay attention. So the five were is uh, is um, um, his top performing salespeople were were highly coachable. Number one, number two is they were very intelligent. Uh, number three, they were hard workers. Number four, they were curious and they had a lot of uh, of prior success. So those were the five proven. Uh, qualities and characteristics. Now to define those quickly, he, he defines coachable as someone who has the ability to listen to and absorb feedback uh, and apply it and, you, and, and incorporate that into what they're doing. So coachability is the ability to, to, um, uh, to absorb and apply feedback that they give. Number two is intelligence. He defines intelligence really as the ability to understand complex technical uh, concepts and be able to explain them to say customers in very simple terms. So understanding the complex technical world of the products and services, but then being able to explain them in very kindergarten, very simple language that anybody can understand. That's intelligence in his mind. Uh, number three is hardworking. Someone who is able to pursue the company's mission with a high degree of energy, but also a lot of daily sales activities, lots of calls, lots of emails, lots of meetings, lots of proposals, lots of closed sales, like that sort of level of activity. That's a hard worker. So somebody who uh, you know is, is energetic and has a high degree of sales activity. Number four, curious. Someone who understands the customer's context, context uh, through asking good questions. So someone who is very curious, a good salesperson who is curious, uh, is very good at asking a lot of good detailed questions to understand the customer's context and, 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 and condition and situation. Number five, last but not least, is prior success, uh, meaning that they, the salespeople, they've got a history of top, top achievement and, and top performance in a variety of areas, whether they're in sales, whether they're in school or whether they're in hobbies or whether they've just got a history of, of top performance and achievement in, in a variety of areas. So the real question is, 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 is after you have profiled your top, your two or three or four top performing salespeople, and you've identified the characteristics or qualities that in your mind make them top producers, then uh, how do you actually interview somebody for those things? Let me share a couple other tactics and strategies with you that Mark Roberge in his book, The uh, Sales uh, acceleration formula uh, gives reference to. Now, uh, using the five that I just went through, coachability, intelligence, hard work, or curious uh, prior success, uh, he gives several examples of actually in an interview setting, how you actually determine whether somebody is low or high in each one of those. So I'll give you some examples. So when it comes to coachability, how do you actually determine if someone is coachable? Well, in, in, a, in an interview, in a job interview, you actually do a role play. 
uh, because this is sales, you're going to do a sales role play. One of you is a prospect. The other person is a salesperson. So there's three steps. So step number one is you do the role play. Uh, there's a salesperson, there's a prospect, you set up a context and they try to sell to you. So you, the sales manager, the interviewer, uh, you're going to be the prospect, uh, the, the, the potential candidate, um, they're the salesperson. So they try to sell something to you, whatever context you want to do. After that's over, you ask them how they did. And hopefully you're listening for them to self-evaluate and give you things that they did well, things that they can do better right? Then you offer them some feedback, coach them, say, well, you know, try this or try that or do this or do that. Give them some feedback. And then that's step two. So step three then is then repeat, do the role play again and pay attention for how, how much effort they put into actually trying to incorporate your suggestions and recommendations and your feedback into what they do. So that's just a simple test to determine how coachable they are by doing a, a role play and giving them feedback and then seeing how they do. You know, you're not looking for perfection. You're just looking for how, uh, if they really put forth an effort in applying that feedback. Okay. Number two is how do you, how do you assess during an interview, how intelligent somebody is? Well, Mark in his book recommends that you give them some technical knowledge or information about your product and service. So if you sell software, then give them like a product sheet that talks about all the bells and whistles and features and benefits of your software. And then in a second conversation, in a second interview, quiz them, ask them questions, pretend you're a customer, pretend they're the salesperson, whoops, uh, and, and then ask them kind of technical questions to see how quickly and easily they can regurgitate all of the technical product information that they learned from the information that you gave to them. How, how easily understandable is it? So simple way to evaluate how intelligent they are. Third is hard worker. Um, how do you tell if somebody is going to crush it on their, on their sales activity and really do a good job at, at crushing quota? Well, you pay attention to the interview process. You pay attention to their behavior uh, during the interview. Are they asking a lot of questions? Are they moving things along? Are they proactive and are they taking initiative? Or are they kind of passive and, and, uh, and, uh, and hesitant? You also uh, check their references, call the references and ask them, are these people hard workers? What do they do? What was their quota? How do they crush it? What, do, what characteristics, how would you describe them? And if hard worker is one of the characteristics that they reference, say, well, you've got some validation there, but also ask them questions during the interview. How do you approach this? Or what's your daily routine for that? Or how do you approach this? You know, and just try to get a sense for, are they pretty passive or pretty active, you know? Um, so that's a hard worker. Uh, number four is curious in an, in, in a job interview, how do you determine whether or not someone is, is naturally curious if they're eager and anxious to learn about someone else in their context by asking a lot of questions? Well, again, you go back to your role play. You do a second role play, uh, prospect salesperson, you set up a situation, do the role play. And what you're listening for is how many questions they ask. Who does the majority of the talking? If the salesperson, the candidate, the, inter the person being interviewed, if they're the ones doing most of the talking, that's a bad sign. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you, the sales manager, the interviewer, and in the role play, the prospect, if you're doing the bulk of the talking, that's a good thing. That means they're asking you questions, but pay attention to the quantity of questions that they're asking you during that simple role play. That gives you an idea it naturally how skilled of question askers they are and how curious they are. Number five, last one, prior success. Uh, just check their references, call their previous employers, ask them about how, you know, whether they were top producers at the bottom of the heap, at the top of the heap, somewhere in between, ask them, ask the candidate themselves about other things that they've been successful at sports, uh, academics, hobbies, like where have they achieved? Where is their top, where's their stellar, uh, achievements and performances get a sense for, you know, do they, where, where else have they kicked butt, uh, you know, in the past. So I really appreciate Mark Roberge's uh, ideas in the interview setting and trying to evaluate where on the scale low to high is this candidate um, in these say characteristics and qualities of top performance. So um, I, I love the examples of, uh, of, of doing role play, asking questions, observing, checking references and, and giving them verbal, you know, verbal tests 
of what they've learned. I love the idea of doing those kinds of things in a job interview to determine how well qualified and suited and aligned uh, a salesperson is to work in your company. So kind of homework, uh, key takeaways from today really is number one, you can avoid a lot of sales performance uh, problems just by hiring the right people. So go slow, do good due diligence during the interview process and, and make sure you hire somebody who's well vetted, right? Number two is in order to set up a matrix to hire against, profile your top one, two, three, four, five salespeople. Come up with, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, areas of criteria or characteristics or qualities that make them top producers. Come up with simple ways to evaluate uh, or score your your candidates that you're interviewing um, to determine if they score high or low in those areas. And then make sure that that when you conduct your job interviews with your salespeople, that you do those things and that you walk out of that interview basically having a completed scorecard on your candidates according to these these four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of criteria that you've been able to evaluate them on. So those are kind of the key takeaways from today. I hope this uh, gets your brain thinking. I hope you're uh, you're thinking about how you can incorporate some of these principles and ideas into uh, your recruiting and your hiring processes and habits. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, if you want a, a, you know, a, a whole lot less stress when it comes to sales enable, enablement. Just make sure you've hired good, good people. So anyway, great to be with you. Uh, post your comments down below, questions that you have about today's episode, things that come to mind, other questions you have, uh, favorite elements or components that we've talked about today. And uh, ask your questions. It's your questions that help kind of feed and fuel future episodes of the Sales Performance Improvement Radio Show. And uh, so I'm excited uh, about to, to hear from you. So be sure to like uh, this one, smash that subscribe button, take a screenshot, share it on social media, tag me, and uh, and I can't wait to interact with you online. So great to be with you guys. Take care and can't, make, can't wait to uh, chat with you more again next week on the next episode of Sales Performance Improvement Radio. Take good care. We'll see you.